Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Order. Statement, the Prime Minister. Yeah. With permission, Mr Speaker, I would like to update the House on the incident in Salisbury and the steps we are taking to investigate what happened and to respond to this reckless and despicable act. Last week, my right honourable friends, the Foreign and Home Secretaries, set out the details of events as they unfolded on Sunday the 4th of March. I am sure the whole House will want to once again pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our emergency services and armed forces in responding to this incident, as well as the doctors and nurses who are now treating those affected. Our thoughts, in particular, are with Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey, who remains in a serious but stable condition. In responding to this incident, he exemplified the duty and courage that define our emergency services and in which our whole nation takes the greatest pride. Mr Speaker, I want to pay tribute to the fortitude and calmness with which people in Salisbury have responded to these events and to thank all those who have come forward to assist the police with their investigation. This incident has, of course, caused considerable concern across the community. Following the discovery of traces of nerve agent in Zizi's restaurant and the Mill pub, the Chief Medical Officer issued further precautionary advice, but as Public Health England have made clear, the risk to public health is low. Mr Speaker, I share the impatience of this House and the country at large to bring those responsible to justice and to take the full range of appropriate responses against those who would act against our country in this way. But as a nation that believes in justice and the rule of law, it is essential that we proceed in the right way, led not by speculation, but by the evidence. Yeah. That is why we have given the police the space and time to carry out their investigation properly. Hundreds of officers have been working around the clock, together with experts from our armed forces, to sift and assess all the available evidence, to identify crime scenes and decontamination sites, and to follow every possible lead to find those responsible. That investigation continues, and we must allow the police to continue with their work. This morning, I chaired a meeting of the National Security Council in which we considered the inv information so far available. As is normal, the Council was updated on the assessment and intelligence picture, as well as the state of the investigation. It is now clear that Mr Skripal and his daughter were poisoned with a military-grade nerve agent of a type developed by Russia. This is part of a group of nerve agents known as Novichok. Based on the positive identification of this chemical agent by world-leading experts at the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory at Porton Down, our knowledge that Russia has previously produced this agent and would still be capable of doing so, Russia's record of conducting state-sponsored assassinations, and our assessment that Russia v views some defectors as legitimate targets for assassinations, the Government has concluded that it is highly likely that Russia was responsible for the act against Sergei and Yulia Skripal. Mr Speaker, there are therefore only two plausible explanations for what happened in Salisbury uh, on the 4th of March. Either this was a direct act by the Russian state against our country, or the Russian government lost control of its potentially catastrophically damaging nerve agent and allowed it to get into the hands of others. This afternoon, my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, has summoned the Russian ambassador to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and asked him, asked him to explain which of these two possibilities it is, and therefore to account for how this Russian-produced nerve agent could have been deployed in Salisbury against Mr Skripal and his daughter. My right honourable friend has stated to the ambassador that the Russian Federation must immediately provide full and complete disclosure of the Novichok programme to the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and he has requested the Russian government's response by the end of tomorrow. Mr Speaker, this action has happened against a backdrop of a well-established pattern of Russian state aggression. 
Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea was the first time since the Second World War that one sovereign nation has forcibly taken territory from another in Europe. Russia has fomented conflict in the Donbass, repeatedly violated the national airspace of several European countries, and mounted a sustained campaign of cyber espionage and disruption. This has included meddling in elections and hacking the Danish Ministry of Defence and the Bundestag, among many others. During his recent State of the Union address, President Putin showed video graphics of missile launches, flight trajectories and explosions, including the modelling of attacks on the United States, with a series of warheads impacting in Florida. While the extrajudicial killing of terrorists and dissidents outside Russia were given legal sanction by the Russian Parliament in 2006. And of course, Russia used radiological substances in its barbaric assault on Mr Litvinenko. We saw promises to assist the investigation then, but they resulted in denial and obfuscation and the stifling of due process and the rule of law. Mr Speaker, following Mr Litvinenko's death, we expelled Russian diplomats, suspended security cooperation, broke off bilateral plans on visas, froze the assets of the suspects and put them on international extradition lists, and these measures remain in place. Furthermore, our commitment to collective defence and security through NATO remains as strong as ever in the face of Russian behaviour. Indeed, our armed forces have a leading role in NATO's enhanced forward presence, with British troops leading a multinational battle group in Estonia. We have led the way in securing tough sanctions against the Russian economy, and we have at all stages worked closely with our allies, and we will continue to do so. We must now stand ready to take much more extensive measures. Mr Speaker, on Wednesday we will consider in detail the response from the Russian state. Should there be no credible response, we will conclude that this action amounts to an unlawful use of force by the Russian state against the United Kingdom. And I will come back to this House and set out the full range of measures that we will take in response. Mr Speaker, this attempted murder using a weapons-grade nerve agent in a British town was not just a crime against the Skripals. It was an indiscriminate and reckless act against the United Kingdom, putting the lives of innocent civilians at risk. And we will not tolerate such a brazen attempt to murder innocent civilians on our soil. I commend this statement to the House. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'd like to thank the Prime Minister in advance, uh, for an advance copy of her statement on this deeply alarming attack that raises very serious questions. The whole House condemns the suspected poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter in Salisbury, and of course we wish them a return to good health. And I'm sure, Mr Speaker, the whole House will join me in wishing Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey a speedy recovery as well. No member of our police force and nobody on the streets of Britain should ever face such an attack, let alone with chemical weapons. I thank the Prime Minister for updating the House. The investigation into the shocking events in Salisbury must reach its conclusions. We need to see both the evidence and a full account from the Russian authorities in light of emerging evidence that the Prime Minister has just referred to. For now, can the Prime Minister clarify what level of threat it was believed Mr Skirpel faced at the time of the attack and what security protection, if any, was deemed necessary for him and his daughter? Mr Speaker, this morning the Conservative Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee said I'd be surprised if the Prime Minister did not point the finger at the Kremlin. The Honourable Member for Tonbridge and Morling also accused the Russian government of behaving in an aggressive and corrupting way in this country. Mr Speaker, we need to continue seeking a robust dialogue with Russia on all the issues currently dividing our countries, both domestic and international, rather than simply cutting off contact and letting the tensions and divisions get worse and potentially even more dangerous. And Mr Speaker, we're all familiar with the way huge fortunes, often acquired in the most dubious circumstances in Russia, sometimes connected with criminal elements, have ended up sheltering in London 
and trying to buy political influence in British party politics. <laughs> Meddling in elections, as the Prime Minister put it, there has and there has been over £800,000 worth of donations to the Conservative Party to the Conservative Party from Russian oligarchs and their associates. So, so, Mr Speaker, if that is the evidence before the Government, even before the investigation into Salisbury is complete, the Government could be taking action, could be taking action to introduce new could be, could be taking action to introduce new financial sanctions powers. But instead, Mr Speaker, they are currently resisting Labour's amendments to the Sanctions and Money Laundering Bill, which could introduce the so-called Magnitsky powers. So will the Prime Minister agree today to back those amendments to the Sanctions and Money Laundering Bill? More specifically, Mr Speaker, when it comes to the order, order there can be strongly held opinions and inflamed passions, but I do appeal to colleagues whose sincerity and integrity I don't doubt to remember that we hear views and other colleagues will be heard, but the right honourable gentleman must be heard. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. More specifically, when it comes to the Salisbury attack, what actions are the local police taking to identify fellow diners at Zizi's restaurant and the Mill Pub in Salisbury on the day in question and ensure they come forward and are checked? What extra resources are being provided to the local police force, which quite understandably have never had to deal with such an incident before? We know that across the country the National Health Service is under incredible pressures at the moment. But what extra resources have been provided to the NHS hospitals in and around Salisbury and what training has been given to NHS staff and GPs in identifying the symptoms from a nerve agent attack? Mr Speaker, the events in Salisbury on the 4th of March have appalled the country and need thorough investigation. The local community and public services involved need reassurance and the resources necessary. The action the Government takes, once the facts are clear, needs to be both decisive and proportionate, and focused on reducing conflicts and tensions rather than increasing them. I join the Prime Minister in paying tribute to the magnificent work of our public services responding to this attack, the NHS staff, the police and security services, the armed forces and the analysts from Porton Down. Let us, Mr Speaker, do everything we can to ensure this never, ever happens again. Can I first of all say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, that I'm sure everybody in the whole House sends their best wishes to all those who have suffered as a result of this incident and wish them uh, a, a recovery. In the case of Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey, uh, I saw a quote which I was not surprised at because I've heard it from so many police officers who've been in dangerous situations before, um, that he was merely doing his job. And we are grateful to him and all our police officers and the emergency yeah. services for doing that. Um, we don't comment on the uh, uh, threats in relation to uh, individual cases, but of course the police and uh, others look, uh, uh, always look to ensure that we are taking uh, these matters fully into account and taking them very seriously. In relation to Russia, uh, we have a very simple approach to Russia, which is engage but beware. <coughs> And I think this shows how right it is that this government has been cautious in relation to its arrangements with Russia. I set out in my Mansion House speech last November very clearly the concerns we have about the activities of Russia. It's a matter I have discussed 
with uh, fellow leaders at the European Union Council. I think we must all be very well aware of the various ways in which Russia is affecting activity across the continent and elsewhere. There can be no question of business as usual with Russia. Uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman raised the issue of party donations. I will say uh, two things to him. First of all, uh, as my Right Honourable Friend the Chancellor of the Exchequer said at the weekend, you shouldn't tar anybody who lives in this country with Russian, uh, of Russian extraction with the same brush. And secondly, and secondly, there are rules on party political donations, and I can assure him that my party, and I hope all parties, follow those rules. He talked about the Magnitsky powers. This is an issue where, and I've been challenged uh, previously uh, before on this question, where we do have already some of the powers that are being uh, proposed in relation to the Magnitsky law, but we have already been talking with all parties about the amendment that has been, uh, uh, has been put down, and we will work to others to ensure that we have the maximum possible consensus before the uh, report stage. He also uh, raised the question of police capabilities and resources. Not only are Wiltshire police involved in this, but they have support from neighbouring forces, as would normally happen uh, when, an incident of this, uh, uh, when an incident takes place which requires that extra capability. But, crucially, at a very early stage, it was decided that counter-terrorism police should take over the responsibility for this, because the counter terrorism police network has capabilities in, uh, which are not available to uh, regional forces, and they are indeed in charge in relation to this. And I can assure the right honourable gentleman that Wiltshire County Council, Salisbury City Council are working with Public Health England, working with the NHS locally, working with the police to ensure that there is maximum information available to members of the public. The Chief Medical Officer has herself reassured members of the public that the public health risk is low and to ensure that the uh, uh, proper arrangements are being put in place to help the police to get on with their inquiries. And that's important. The police are still working, investigating this, and we should ensure that they have the time and space to be able to conduct those investigations. Mr Ian Duncan Smith. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I commend my right honourable friend for rising to this occasion as she should. Many in this House would wish that the Leader of the Opposition had abandoned party politics and done just the same. She is quite right. If the response from the Russian ambassador is simply not credible, she is quite right to expect the House to back her in taking the most severe action as is required and commensurate. Uh, and she is also right to remind the House and the country that this country, Russia, is now close to being a rogue state as any. It occupies Crimea. It has helped occupy eastern Ukraine. It has created a hell on earth in Syria and is even now overseeing worse action. This is a country locking up its members of the opposition. It is a country, frankly, we've learned this lesson before. If we appease a country like this, then we expect even worse. I thank my right honourable friend for his remarks, and he is absolutely right. Nobody should be in any doubt of the various activities that the Russian state is involved in across the continent of Europe uh, and elsewhere, and the damage that that is doing uh, in, uh, in so many different places. And he is absolutely right that that is why it is important that this government, that this country, stands up very clearly and not only calls out actions by Russia, but also ensures that we have a robust response to them. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for an advance copy of her statement and share with her the concerns around the recent attack in Salisbury. It's important that we all work together to get to the bottom of what has happened here. Mr Speaker, there can be no denying that this assassination attempt on Mr Sergei Skirpov and his daughter Yulia is not only a step too far by those responsible, but calls into question every aspect of our current and future relationship with Russia. Mr Speaker, this ruthless action 
puts not only the lives of our emergency services at risk, but also threatens the safety of the wider public who were enjoying a Sunday afternoon in the Cathedral City of Salisbury. Everyone has the right to live in the UK in security and in safety, and any challenge to those rights needs to be responded to in an appropriate manner. Police have so far identified more than 200 witnesses and 240 pieces of evidence in this attempted killing. Our thoughts, all of us, our thoughts are with Nick Bailey and his family, and we wish him a speedy recovery. We commend the emergency services for putting their lives on the line in order to defend all of us. However, there are legitimate concerns around the delay in time between the events on Sunday the 4th of March and yesterday, when the Chief Medical Officer advised the public who had been at the residence in the pub to wash their clothing and personal items. Can the Prime Minister give reassurances today to those members of the public who may have real concerns that they may have been exposed to the effects of the nerve agent used? Mr Speaker, I welcome the Prime Minister's actions detailed in her statement, and can I ask when she intends to return to the House to update us all on what measures that we can all take? There must be a form and strong action taken to send a clear message to the Kremlin. We will not accept Russian interference in our democracy or in our way of life. I hope the Prime Minister will be taking time to raise this matter with colleagues across the EU as our closest allies help to give us a strong voice when we all speak as one. This kind of international outrage must never again be seen on our streets. Can I, can I first of all thank the Right Honourable Gentleman for the tone that he has adopted in his response to this statement? Because this is indeed a matter which should concern us all. Uh, it is, this is a matter of national interest. It is a, a matter of an attack that has taken place, uh, and uh, we, must, uh, we must respond to it appropriately, as he said. I think uh, he asked a question about the Chief Medical Officer's uh, most recent advice to those who had been in the Zizi's restaurant or in the pub. Uh, the answer to that is that, of course, over the course of time last week, um, as uh, work was being done on this issue, more information was, became available about the nature of the agent that had been used, and that led to that precautionary advice being uh, made yesterday. Uh, he also asked when I will be returning to the House. As I said in my statement, we will consider in detail the response from the Russian state on Wednesday, and I will return to the House at the earliest possible opportunity. Tom Tugendhat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This, if not an act of war, was certainly a warlike act by the Russian Federation. And this is not the first we've seen. And while some in this House have stayed silent and decided to join the information warfare that that state is conducting against us and our allies, we have seen them invade countries in the East, attack allies, attempt to kill prime ministers, and even now. Even now, they are backing the murderous Assad regime, which fizzes nothing in gassing its own people, and the honourable gentleman opposite stays silent. Yes. Would, the, would my right honourable friend agree with me that now is the time for us to call on our allies, to call on the European Union, who has worked with us so well on sanctions, on NATO, and particularly on the United States, and ask what they will do to assist us? in this moment when we are in need. Yeah. Well, can, I, can I say to my honourable friend, I think it is, he is absolutely right. Uh, we should be giving a robust response from the whole of this House to this, uh, to this incident, this act that has taken place. But we also will be working, uh, there has already been uh, a number of uh, engagements with our allies on this uh, particular matter, and we will be continuing to talk with our allies to ensure both that they are aware of what has happened on British soil uh, and uh, also that uh, we can talk with them about the response that we will be giving. Sir Vincent Cable. Would the Prime Minister not agree that one of the most effective ways of punishing Russia for these appalling activities uh, would be to seize the private property assets of members of the Putin regime and their associates? And as a first step, could she arrange to publish a list of who they are and what they own? 
can I say to the uh, right honourable gentleman that, of course, we are aware here of the need in the United Kingdom to ensure that our financial system cannot be used for uh, illicit money flows, and action, appropriate action is taken by law enforcement and other bodies to ensure that we do identify such flows and that we make the appropriate response to them. Uh, as he will know, we are already putting in place a number of uh, measures to improve the information that is available in a transparent way in relation to the holding of certain assets here uh, by those from overseas, uh, and uh, that is something that we will continue to work on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Dominic Grieve. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. I entirely agree with the Prime Minister in her approach to this murderous attack. But she will be aware and has stated that it's part of a pattern of behaviour by which a state uses covert means in breach of both international law and the rule of law to attack with impunity whoever it wishes. In those circumstances, would she agree with me that we face a very particular challenge which is not likely to go away any time soon? And in that context, in trying to inform the public of the risks and of the appropriate way of responding for a parliamentary democracy, could I encourage her to make use of the Intelligence and Security Committee, who chose to carry out an inquiry into Russia's threat last autumn, so that we can take that forward and provide as much information as we can publicly about the nature of the threat and the best means of responding to it? I uh, say to my right honourable friend that I think it was uh, very good that the ISC had already announced that it would be considering issues around Russian activity against the UK that requires investigation. I think uh, I look forward to the uh, work that the, uh, his committee will be doing on that particular matter, and the government will work with the ISC, ISC to share relevant information that is within its remit. Yvette Cooper. Thank the Prime Minister for her statement, and it is hard to see any alternative to her very grave conclusion that this was either a direct act by the Russian state against our country or the Russian government has lost control of a dangerous nerve agent. And in that context, I hope the whole House will be able to come together behind firm response yeah. from the government of our national security and public safety. And can I therefore ask her whether the National Security Council have asked for a review of the 14 other cases that I wrote to the Home Secretary about to see whether any of those should be investigated and also to press her on what further action she has taken in preparation for potential UN Security Council resolutions that perhaps should be drafted in order to get the widest possible international support. Oh, well done, yeah. Can I, can I say to the right honourable lady that she's absolutely right about the need for there to be a clear response from the whole of this House, and I think everybody in this House should be of no doubt uh, of the nature of what, is, what has happened and that we should respond robustly to it. Um, I understand that my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has responded to uh, the right honourable lady's letter in relation to those 14 uh, other cases. Um, uh, and I think a focus at the moment should be on ensuring that the resources are being put into this criminal investigation so that we ensure that the police are able to do their work with the maximum time and space. Uh, Dr Julian Lewis. Does the Prime Minister recall that when Edward Heath expelled over 100 Russian so-called diplomats in the early 1970s, it gave a blow to Russian intelligence operations against this country from which it never recovered till the end of the Cold War. Does she also recall that when it was clear that a member of the Libyan embassy staff, which one was unknown, had killed WPC von Fletcher, a wholesale expulsion of staff occurred then, and does she therefore conclude that as it would be impossible for an operation to have been mounted by the Russian state without someone in the London Russian Embassy knowing about it, similar measures may well be necessary. Uh, thank my, uh, my honourable friend, and uh, as I said in the statement that I gave, uh, the Right, my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, has called the Russian Ambassador into the Foreign and Commonwealth Office today. He has presented these two uh, possibilities of the uh, origin of this action to uh, him, and we wait for the Russian state's response. 
I am very clear that, should that response not be credible, uh, we will conclude that this action is an unlawful use of force by the Russian state against the United Kingdom. And as I said earlier, I will come back to this House and set out the full range of measures that we will take in response. Naturally, there is the most intense interest in this extraordinarily grave matter, and I am keen to accommodate colleagues. Can I ask colleagues to help me to help each of them? by confining themselves to pithy questions. Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister agree that in the face of yet further aggression from the Russian mafia state, that the policy of the Leader of the Opposition to engage in robust dialogue will only encourage Putin to engage in further acts of state-sponsored terror? And would she agree that in the national interest, uh, and uh, in regards of the cost to this country, that the only effective answer is to have robust action against those who are using the UK as a battleground to carry out their own acts of assassination. Well, I, I agree with the honourable gentleman that we need to ensure that we do in fact respond robustly uh, to this matter, but we need to uh, do so with careful consideration of the assessments that have been made and the information that is available to us, and that is exactly what the Government is doing. But I think nobody in this House should be in any doubt that there can be no suggestion of business as usual in relation to our, our uh, interaction with Russia. Mr. Andrew Mitchell. Mr. Speaker, the whole country will welcome the precise and clear statement which the Prime Minister has delivered to the House yeah, this yeah, afternoon, yeah, yeah, yeah. and in particular setting out precisely what she will do in terms of laying out the evidence for the international community and for the United Nations of the act that has been perpetrated on British soil. And may I also welcome the comments she made about the so called Magnitsky <coughs> Amendment? There are many of us across the House of Commons who believe that this could make a big contribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I hope that uh, she will continue consider following the way in which America, Canada and three European countries have introduced this particular amendment. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I recognise that my right honourable friend has been, uh, is supporting the amendment and has been working on this, uh, this issue. And I say to him, as I have done earlier, that we do want to ensure that we get the maximum possible consensus across the House on this, uh, on this particular issue, and we will talk to uh, those parties involved to ensure that uh, the ap approach that is taken is one that is going to. The Shadow Foreign Secretary keeps saying there is an amendment down. There is, the, the, the is, a, there is an amendment down. There is an amendment down. Discussions are taking place with parties about the impact of the amendment as currently drafted and ensuring that any action that is taken is going to be action that we can assure will work. Ben Bradshaw. Can I commend the Prime Minister for today making the sort of resolute and realistic statement about the Kremlin that many of us have been looking for in this House for some time? Would she invite the heroic and brave Bill Browder, who has done more than any other single individual to uncover the Kremlin's methods, to give her a full briefing about what he knows of Putin's cronies' money laundering exploits in London and British political figures who have been corrupted by Kremlin money? And will she make sure that the whole of the Government machinery is now giving full cooperation to Robert Mueller's inquiry in the United States because of what he has already uncovered about what the Russians have been doing here. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, we have already been uh, clear in relation to the Mueller inquiry that we will, of course, respond to appropriate requests. I am told that the other individual that he referred to um, uh, is, has actually already met the security minister and therefore has been able to brief him on, uh, on what he knows. Vicky Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Friends from especially Scandinavia, the Baltics and across Eastern Europe have often told me how much they feel increasingly at risk from a rise in Russian aggression. Can my right honourable friend update the House on how we work with our allies in response to this incident? I'm, my uh, honourable friend is absolutely right, and I'm very conscious that those who are particularly geographically close to Russia on the European continent um, very, uh, do feel very much the immediacy of uh, many of the activities that Russia in, uh, gets involved in, particularly around uh, matters, for example, on propaganda yeah. use. Um, and I 
will certainly be speaking to a number of our allies. I think it is important not only that people recognise what uh, has taken place here in the United Kingdom, but also the implications that it has uh, if it is a Russian state activity, the implications that it has for Russia's activities elsewhere on the continent of Europe. Mike Gapes. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I also commend the Prime Minister for her remarks? The last time we had uh, a clear, defined, state-sponsored act of terrorism was in 2006, and she's referred to it. Can she also have conversations with her predecessor Prime Minister at that time, <laughs> Tony Blair, about some of the issues that arose subsequent to the actions we took, because it is quite clear the Russians will retaliate and we will then be into a tit-for-tat process. They think we will back down. We've got to say resolutely and strongly we are not backing down. This is an act of terrorism and all members of Parliament should stand together. Yes. Can, I, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, he's absolutely right that uh, when we take action, we must ensure that that is action that we will continue to follow through. As I said in my statement, many of the actions that were taken in response to the Litvinenko, uh, Litvinenko murder are actually still in place in relation to our relations with the, uh, with the Russian state. But uh, nobody should be in any doubt of the likelihood of a, uh, 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 an impact from the, uh, the Russian state in attempting to, as they did in that case, in attempting to suggest that the information that we were putting out was incorrect. Uh, actually, what we saw, particularly from the inquiry that uh, obviously followed sub uh, significantly later, which very firmly put the uh, responsibility for Litvinenko's murder at the door of the Russian state and indeed of President Putin. Mark Francois. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Can I commend the Prime Minister for the robust tone of her statement, yeah. which I believe is entirely appropriate? Would she also accept that while we may not be in a period of Cold War with Russia, as we were in the 1980s, because of their actions it could be said that we are at least now entering a period of Cool War? And if that be so, would you be prepared at the appropriate time to look again at our ability to deter Russia and at the resources that we may require in order to do so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, can I uh, say to my honourable friend that, um, as I have said, uh, I've said previously, there is no question of business as usual with Russia. We must be very clear of the actions that they have, uh, that they have taken. I think this, this incident um, proves that the actions we've taken over the past decade have been entirely justified. Um, what we see is uh, a Kremlin that is intent, seems to be intent on dismantling the international rules-based order, and we should stand up resolutely in defence of that international order. Flynn. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The evidence the Prime Minister provided today makes it absolutely clear that the onus is on the Russian state to explain how this nerve agent <coughs> entered into our country. And I thank her for her answer to my colleague, the Chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee. It's absolutely essential that we can, where possible, ensure the public are aware of the Russian threat, but does she also agree that our inquiry should also be able to understand the pressures on our intelligence security services and how best they are supported to do the job they have yeah, to do? Yeah, yeah. To the right honourable lady, that of course it is for the ISC committee itself to determine the breadth of the, uh, of the inquiries that it undertakes within the remit that it has been set um, by, uh, by this uh, by this House and by, uh, and by Government. Uh, so it is, it is for that committee to determine those particular issues. Of course, extra resources are being put into the security and intelligence agencies um, because we have recognised the increasing challenges and threats that we need to address, uh, and uh, that's why those resources are, have uh, significant resources are going into the SIA. Mr Crispin Blunt. The grisly fate of so many of President Putin's opponents, both at home and abroad, even those of such high profile as Boris Nemtsov. No one in this House, least of all the leader of the opposition, should have any doubt of the nature of the government we are dealing with. Yeah, 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 yeah. Having said that, and uh, will su supporting all the measures she will take against the government of Russia, uh, if it turns out the way we all anticipate, uh, will she try, as far as is possible, 
to continue the opportunity for British society in its widest sense to be open with the people of Russia so the virus of truth and openness can do its work on that regime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's... Um uh, my honourable friend has raised an important issue, which is that, of course, what we are talking about is the dealings the UK government has with the Russian, and this country has with the Russian state. Uh, of course, I think it is important that people in Russia understand the exact nature of the regime that, uh, uh, that is uh, in government there at the moment. Chris Bryant. I don't suppose there's a single member of this House that is surprised that President Putin would resort to violence because he's done it so many times before. 334 killed in the Beslan massacre, 170 killed unnecessarily in the Moscow um, theatre siege, 299 killed in the M17 aeroplane that was brought down, down by the Russians, countless journalists, countless people who've stood up to him as political opponents in other countries around the world, murdered by him, and, yes, Sergei Magnitsky. I hear what the Prime Minister says, but can I just ask, for the 29th time I'm asking this question now, can we just make sure that at the end of this process, nobody who was involved in the murder of Sergei Magnitsky or in the corruption that he unveiled will be allowed into this country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for that matter, can we just stop Russia today broadcasting its propaganda in this country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as I, can I say to the right honourable gentleman that obviously, and I, I, because I know he's asked me the question about the Magnitsky uh, issue previously on many occasions in this House when I was Home Secretary and subsequently, um, and of course we do already have uh, a number of powers that enable us to take action against, uh, against individuals to prevent them from coming into this, uh, this country, but we are looking seriously at the, uh, at the amendments, and as I say, we do want to ensure that we get maximum consensus in relation to, uh, in relation to this issue. And uh, on, the, uh, on the further action that we might take as a government, as I say, I will be returning to the House at the earliest possible opportunity late, uh, to, once we have the response from the Russian state, to update the House on the further measures that we will take. Mr. Hugo Speaker, if you have one permanent member of the UN uh, Security Council uh, carrying out a targeted assassination in the country of, of another, surely it is time for the UN Secretary General to launch an immediate inquiry. Uh, I thank my honourable uh, right honourable friend for his uh, suggestion. Can I say to him that, of course, the United Nations is one of those bodies that we will be speaking to about the nature of this uh, incident that has taken place here in the United Kingdom, among other uh, among other allies and uh, other organisations such as uh, NATO. But we will certainly be raising this matter with the UN. And Luciana Berger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While these investigations are ongoing and we're waiting for the response from the Russian government, can I ask the Prime Minister what her government is doing to protect other people who might be targeted here in the UK? Um, can I say to the Honourable Lady, we don't talk about the uh, measures that are taken in, res in relation to individuals. That is a matter for the uh, police and uh, the, uh, for law enforcement generally, um, but I can assure her that that is a matter that uh, is being considered. Johnny Mercer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I think I've just seen, and I would look at my honourable friend opposite as I say this, I think I've just seen the most shameful moments I've seen in this House of Commons in my time uh, today. It is clear that this sovereign United Kingdom has come, to, come under attack from another state. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that the character of conflict is changing? And we must be relentless in trying to keep pace with that and that nothing will stop those who are doing this work receive the resources they need to do it. Minister. My honourable friend is absolutely right that the character of uh, the threats that we face is changing. They are diversifying, and we need to ensure that we are able to deal with, uh, all, with those threats across the range of actions that need to, uh, that need to be taken. And indeed, some of those will not uh, always fall into what might conventionally be considered to be defence. Don Brake. Uh, will the Prime Minister confirm that we bear the Russian people uh, nothing but goodwill? It is President Putin who we have uh, in our sights, and we will not allow him to use this in the presidential elections to burnish his image as a strong man. The, the right honourable gentleman is absolutely right. It is the Russian state 
that we are challenging in relation to this, uh, this particular uh, uh, act that has taken place on UK soil, uh, not, the, not the Russian people. And John Whittingdale. Is it not increasingly clear that we are engaged in hybrid warfare? With Russia, which includes disinformation, political yep. interference, cyber attacks, yep. and now very possibly this act of attempted murder. In considering how to respond, will my right hand friend also look at what additional help we might give to the people of Ukraine who are the front line yeah, yeah. in resisting yeah, yeah, yeah. Russian aggression yeah. uh, and expansionism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thank my, uh, thank my right honourable friend, and he's absolutely right. We do need to look across the uh, very diverse nature of the threat that we, that we face and uh, the actions that we are taking, and we have already been taking a number of actions in support of the, uh, of the Ukraine, uh, is also uh, an important part of our deliberations and an important part of, of uh, our response. Malcolm MacDonald. The Schleswig-Holstein question was understood by only three people. Everybody understands what is happening here today, and there can be no criticism of the tone the Prime Minister has adopted. She will know that under Article 4 of NATO, she can raise this as a concern with her NATO allies. Does she intend to do so? As, uh, as I have said in response to a number of other questions, we will be raising this with allies in a number of uh, forms. And uh, I will uh, obviously we'll consider, as I said earlier, the response from the Russian state on Wednesday. And I will return at the earliest possible opportunity to this House to set out further measures. Michelle Donnellan. Will the Prime Minister join me in commending Wiltshire's police and health services, who have done a superb job responding to this difficult case, and who highlight the level of dedication and public service that is evident not just in Wiltshire, but up and down the country of our emergency services? Yeah. Very happy to join my honourable friend in commending the uh, valuable work that has been done by emergency services in Wiltshire but also they are simply a fine example of the dedication and commitment of our public services and emergency services across the whole country. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I have absolutely no doubt that the only way to deal, deal with Putin's regime in Russia is robustly, <laughs> decisively, and together as a parliament and a country. And I also want to add my voice to those talking about the repression of the Russian people themselves, not least in Chechnya, where Putin continues to back the brutal regime of Ramzan Kadyrov and his uh, attacks on the LGBT community. But on Russia today, can I urge the Prime Minister to speak with the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport to look at reviewing Russia Today's broadcasting licence and to speak to the House authorities about blocking their broadcasts in this building itself. Why should we be watching their propaganda in this Parliament? Yes, well, as I've said in, in response to a number of questions, I will uh, obviously we will look at the response from the Russian state, but I will come back to this House at the earliest opportunity to look at uh, the range of measures which could be necessary. And I think, uh, in relation to the House authorities, the, uh, as the honourable gentleman we will be aware, that would not be a matter for me, but for the House authorities. And I think we've heard the honourable gentleman loudly and clearly. Thank you. Uh, Dr Andrew Murison. Can I congratulate the Prime Minister for her powerful statement and for her leadership in this incredibly grave matter. Is Russia a fit and proper state to be hosting or engaging in international sporting fixtures in 2018? Can I say what I will say in answer to my honourable friend is that uh, we, uh, as I said in response in Prime Minister's questions last week, I think uh, we will be in a position of considering the attendance at that uh, particular, uh, the particular event that is coming up in Russia, notably the World Cup, of dignitaries and ministers here from the United Kingdom. Leslie, I say to the Prime Minister that there should be unity across the House yeah. in terms of what I feel is a proportionate and sensible approach that she's taken to analysing what's been happening and coming back to report to the House. And can I also say that there are certain circumstances, as she knows, where we take party political differences of opinion, but when our country is potentially under attack, yeah. that is just not appropriate. Yeah. Can, I, can I thank the right honourable gentleman for the tone that he has adopted? He is absolutely right. This is a question of the national interest. It's a question of the interest of our country and what another state may have done on British soil to people living here in the United Kingdom. And that should be a matter that would con should concern all of us and should be above party politics. Mark Harper. 
having served with my right honourable friend in the Home Office, she will do what is right to keep our country safe. Can she confirm that if it is the conclusion of Her Majesty's Government that there was unlawful use of force by the Russian state, that we possess a considerable range of offensive cyber capabilities which we will not hesitate to deploy against that state if it is necessary to keep our country safe? Well, can I say to my right hon. Friend that uh, we, uh, of course, will look at responses across a number of, uh, of areas uh, of activity, should it be, as, as he has said and as I said in my statement, that we conclude that this action does amount to an unlawful use of force by the Russian state here in the UK. Um. <sighs> Nick Dakin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's good that the Prime Minister comes here today and spells out what actions are already taken and promises to return again and inform us on what happens next. Will she also make sure that the lessons learnt in the Salisbury community about this threat and how to prevent it in local communities is, is shared in an appropriate way with other communities across the country? Well, I'm, I'm very happy to say that I th I'm sure there will be lessons coming out of, of this for local communities, for the NHS, the police themselves as they look into this matter, and I'm sure those, we will ensure that those are available to all across the country. Alex Chalk. Considering Russia, we should never forget that for all its geographical size, Russia's economy is a little more than half that of the UK. In those circumstances, does my right honourable friend agree with me that British economic levers are far more potent than some might realise, and we should not hesitate, if the circumstance demand it, to pull them hard? Well, as I've, as I've said, we will be looking uh, at uh, the full range of measures uh, should we, once we've considered the response that has come from the Russian state. But it is, in fact, the United Kingdom. We have been one of the leaders in uh, ensuring that, within the European Union, that sanctions against Russia are in place as a result of the action that they took place in Crimea and Ukraine. Emma Reynolds. This horrific attempted murder on British soil demands a strong and united response yeah, by this yeah, House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can she confirm whether the nerve agent in question is banned under the Chemical Weapons Convention and that Russia is signatory to that convention? Yes, yes it, is, uh, uh, it is illegal to use a nerve agent of this, uh, this sort. It is one, I understand, it is one that is banned under the convention. Bob Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that this attack probably involved a professional Russian, uh, probably involved a professional Russian trained operative in order to carry out such an individually targeted assault with what must have been a very minute amount of something like sarin, VX or tabin, which could so easily have had catastrophic, wide scale indiscriminate and deadly consequences. Well, I say to uh, my honourable friend that uh, I will not speculate about the nature of the uh, individual who is responsible for this uh, individual or individuals who are responsible for this attack. That is, of course, a matter for the police investigation. Mr Barry Sherman. Mr Speaker, will the Prime Minister agree? Now we have all agreed that uh, Russia is a clear and present danger. We have got to be fully organised to meet that danger. And would you agree with me that we, we, if we walk out into London tonight, we see Russian mafia, Russian security people swaggering about our capital city. All over Europe we see them. What they don't like is sanctions that bite. Will she come back to this House on an early occasion, actually with a firm list of sanctions, new sanctions we can take against Russia? <laughs> Well, the, uh, the honourable gentleman is uh, asking me to refer to a, t a particular measure. As I have said uh, in my statement and in answer to a number of questions, we will consider the response from the Russian state, and uh, I, should, it, should there be no credible response, there we will uh, determine, we will conclude that the action amounts to unlawful use of force by the Russian state in the United, uh, in the United Kingdom, and I will return with further measures. Sir Nicholas Soames. Would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, confirm that despite the difficulties the American presidency may have on these issues, that we are fully engaged with the American government and our allies on this very important matter? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm very happy to give my right honourable friend the uh, confirmation that we have been engaged with our allies and will continue to be engaged with our allies on this important issue. 
Pat McFadden. Thank you. Can I thank the Prime Minister for coming to the House with this very important but sadly not surprising conclusion today? She is going to make a further statement on Wednesday, but can I ask her to say a bit more about the possible options for response and to ensure, at a time when there are voices and forces trying to erode confidence in open democratic societies, that those responses will place us firmly and foursquare behind the solidarity and security of the West. I am sure I hope the right honourable gentleman will forgive me if I say that I uh, would not, will not set out today what the response uh, is going to be, because obviously we need to consider the response from the Russian state and uh, put together the, uh, further measures, uh, appropriate further measures uh, to g- ensure that we give the robust response that I and other members of this House have been calling for. But he can be rest assured, as can other members of this House, that we see a Russia that is flouting the uh, international rules based order. Uh, we have been very clear about that, uh, and we uh, will stand up, stand up for democracy, stand up for the rule of law, stand up for that international rules-based order and, and the values that underpin it, and uh, continue to be committed to the security and defence of, uh, of Europe and the defence of the values that underpin the West. Richard Graham. Speaker, I understand the nerve agent Novichok was developed by Russia specifically to avoid being covered by the Chemical Weapons Treaty and to avoid detection by standard equipment. So could my right honourable friend today confirm firstly that Novichok is a totally illegal substance under a treaty to which Russia is signatory and that any knowledge of detection and treatment that we learn from this ghastly attack will be shared with authorities and health authorities, not just in this country, but with our allies abroad as well. Yes. Well, can I say to my honourable friend that it is very clear that the use of such an earth agent goes against the spirit of the, of the treaty in relation to the use of, uh, of chemical weapons. We will, of course, um, be, as my honourable friend would expect, um, be talking to the, the uh, responsible body in relation to chemical weapons to raise this issue with them. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In light of the Prime Minister's comments, which I command, does, commend, does the PM agree that there is no place for un- honourable members on all sides of the House to appear on uh, Russia Today? It is a propaganda mouthpiece for the Russian state and should not be engaged with by any democratic politicians, and they should think twice before they do so. We should not be engaging with a major outlet like this and give it credibility. Yeah. Well, I think we should all be uh, very uh, wary and very careful in looking at media outlets that uh, uh, any individual uh, member of this House chooses to, uh, chooses to appear on. But as I've said in response to other questions, um, this uh, issue of Russia today is obviously one which is of concern to members from across this, uh, across this House. Um, but of course, as I said, I will be coming back and making further statement in this House uh, after we've had the Russian state response. Sir Desmond Swain. In the early 1980s, the planning assumption was that the road to war with the Soviet Union would be preceded by six months of increasing tension, sabotage and assassination. What are the current assumptions? (laughs) Well, can I say to my uh, my honourable friend that I think what we see today, uh, there was a time when that uh, uh, issue of the threats that were posed to us by uh, Russia and indeed by others were uh, clear and um, limited in their type. What we see today is a diversity of threats. With Russia, we see as being, as being referenced uh, in, uh, indeed in the previous question about its use of propaganda. We see them using a whole variety of means in which to attempt to interfere, to intervene and to, uh, uh, to affect countries in the, uh, countries in the West. And we, therefore, in terms of our approach to this, have to be able to respond across the whole range of threats that are posed. Christine Jardine. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I would also like to thank the Prime Minister for her remarks here today about this growing crisis. I appreciate she will not want to give individual circumstances, but can the Prime Minister reassure the House that not only former Russian nationals, uh, former Eastern Eastern European nationals, who may also have... um, offended Mr Putin, but British um, high-profile figures and indeed British public buildings are being reviewed in order to determine the status of security in light of the recent situation. 
to the Honourable Lady that, as I've said earlier, and she's absolutely right, we don't comment on individual, on individual cases. In relation to national security, we regularly uh, update, monitor and update uh, the uh, actions that are taken in the protection of people and, uh, and premises here in the United Kingdom based on the threat as we perceive it at the time. Benyon. <laughs> as someone who's uh, campaigned on a, uh, for, for a Magnitsky law and who is on the Bill Committee of the Sanctions and Money Laundering Bill, can I say that the opposition amendments, though well-intentioned, were flawed and can be improved on? And I'm extremely grateful to the cooperation of our ministers, and I hope the discussions will be fruitful. Will, will my right honourable friend re reflect that our allies abroad need to understand this could easily have happened in a, prov in a provincial town in France, Germany or any other country, and we were looking, we are looking for action to be taken as well as warm words of support. Can I say to my right honourable friend, first of all, I'm grateful to him as uh, a supporter of uh, the uh, of Magnitsky law, that, uh, pointing out the point that I was trying to make earlier, which is that if amendments are to be passed and added to legislation, we need to ensure that they're actually going to be workable and we need to get the, the amendments uh, we need to get the amendments right. And, um, but also, in response, in response to uh, the point that he made about our allies, he's absolutely right. This, I think we should point out to people, is something that could have happened uh, anywhere, uh, in any provincial town or indeed any city uh, like Salisbury. John Woodcock. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The level of resilience voiced by the Prime Minister in, in the Chamber today has been many years in coming, but it is yeah, yeah. hugely welcome. Indeed, it would put our national security at significant risk if we were led by anyone who did not understand the gravity of the threat which Russia poses to this nation. Can I ask her? She mentioned her, our NATO allies. She is going to come forward with measures on Wednesday. Will she confirm that our NATO allies and the potential for collective response is in her thinking in doing so? Minister. Can, I, can I thank the Honourable Gentleman for the comments that he has made? He is absolutely right. It is imperative that in this country we recognise the nature of the threat and the nature of the actions that Russia has taken, as I've said, across a wide range of, uh, a wide range of means. And uh, I'm also very clear that as we look at, at uh, the, any further actions that need to be taken, we need to ensure that that is robust, that it does very clearly defend our values here in the United Kingdom and ensure that we're sending a very clear message to those who would seek to undermine those. And Jonathan Ginogli. Mr Speaker, um, in congratulating the Prime Minister on her robust stance against Russian aggression, she will be aware that the very most effective sanctions are those taken multilaterally. The concern that some have is that when we leave the European Union, we will lose our seat at the table on the body that sets those uh, sanctions. And can she therefore reassure us that a lot of effort is going to go into building up a new relationship so that we will have continuity in our approach towards Russia. My, uh, my honourable friend, and indeed this issue of collective action was the one that the honourable gentleman, the member for Barrow, had raised in his previous, uh, previous question. Obviously, as my honourable friend has said, um, that the position in relation to the UK government's uh, uh, actions on sanctions will change when we leave the European Union. Uh, we are taking, obviously, put in place measures to ensure that we are able to act uh, as the United Kingdom independently. But I also made uh, clear in the speech that I gave at the Mansion House that ish on issues like sanctions, this is one on which we would want to be working with uh, our allies, because indeed, as both he and the Honourable Member for Barrow have said, uh, they are more effective if they are undertaken collectively. Yeah. Mr Speaker, in commending the Prime Minister for the stance she has adopted uh, today, when she returns to the House, will she take the opportunity to assuage the cross-party concerns on the Defence Select Committee? Uh, that there has been a de-escalation of our presence in the High North, uh, that the, a de-escalation of our presence in the High North, uh, a reduction in maritime uh, surveillance uh, and patrols, and in fact a cancellation 
of our cold weather training this year. There is a need for investment in defence, and I do hope the Prime Minister may take this opportunity to deliver it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I uh, assure the honourable gentleman that we look very carefully at the uh, uh, actions that we are taking at the training exercises that our military forces undertake? Uh, and uh, as I indicated in my statement, I am pleased that our forces are leading part of the NATO's enhanced forward presence in Estonia. I visited those forces in Estonia uh, in the autumn of last year, and I can say not only uh, is that valuable for our forces, but it is also hugely welcomed by the people of Estonia, who are obviously right against the, the uh, border with Russia and feel the threat very particularly. Andrew Bowie. Mr. Speaker, uh, I thank the Prime Minister for her statement, and in doing so, would like to pay tribute to a group of individuals so far, I think, unmentioned this afternoon. That's the members of the armed forces yeah, yeah. personnel who attended yeah, with the yeah. professionalism yeah. and selfless devotion to duty that we, of course, expected them. I would also like to ask what she is doing with our allies in NATO, in the UN, and, of course, in the European Union to ensure the maintenance of the international rules-based system, which is under systemic threat from the Russian Federation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can I, uh, can I reiterate uh, what my honourable friend has said? In fact, I did uh, mention them in my statement, but once again, uh, I, I praise the work of the armed forces alongside our emergency services in relation to this particular incident and what they also do for us in the armed forces day in and uh, day, in and day out. And uh, I can assure him that we will be looking very carefully at any further measures that we should be, uh, should be taking in response to this. Uh, the Prime Minister should know that if by Wednesday she concludes we are indeed embattled, she will find both unity and resolve across this House in facing down a common threat. Twelve years ago, in the aftermath of a wave of Al-Qaeda-inspired attacks, we transformed the capacity of government to coordinate and fight back against ex- extremism. Can I urge her, in the measures she brings forward on Wednesday, to think radically about how she creates the governing capacity to coordinate our response to this new level of threat, including new safeguards against abuse of social media, which we know is part of the Russians' active measures playbook. Can I thank the Right Honourable Gentleman for his, uh, for his remarks uh, and the tone with which he has uh, set those out? And can I say that we do, of course, and he's, he's right, after the attacks by uh, al-Qaeda, it was very clear the then government here put in place a whole new structure of response in terms of, of counter-terrorism. Of course, hostile state activity is something that government has been consistently looking at over, over many years. But as we have looked at our national security capability review, as we look at our uh, uh, ability to react to the threats that we now face, we will, of course, ensure that the structures within government are such that it is possible properly to coordinate the actions that we need to take. George Freeman. Yeah, could I welcome the statesmanlike tone of the Prime Minister's comments yeah, yeah. in stark contrast to the, to the comments of the Right Honourable Leader of the Opposition opposite, yeah, the Soviet yeah, yeah. ramblings yeah. that would have done no benefit to Russia today. Could I urge her to be uncompromising <laughs> in signalling that British and European Liberal Democratic values are not negotiable, that this government will not allow this country to be a playground for Kremlin kleptocrats, and would she consider aggressive cultural sanctions to hit Mr Putin and his team where it hurts, including particularly considering boycotting sporting events. Well, I thank my my honourable friend for the uh, remarks that that he has made. And uh, I assure him, as I've said to others, that we will be looking at a range of activities, uh, a range of uh, responses, and I will update the House further at the earliest opportunity. Um, Can I also say, just to confirm, that it is indeed those democratic values that underpin uh, us as, an, as uh, a country that we will be defending and will continue to defend, but to wish to do so alongside our allies. Yeah. Uh, 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 it was ra- remarked earlier that the international rules-based order is under threat from, uh, yeah. from Russia. Uh, I have to say the international rules-based order is also under threat from others, and it's important that we stand up and robustly defend it. Yeah. 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 Three people are gravely ill in hospital following this horrific chain of events. So can I welcome the Prime Minister's resolve that business cannot go on as usual? Could she then take this opportunity to tighten up the loopholes that do exist in the system concerning money laundering? So the from Russia with cash situation that has occurred all too often doesn't turn into one of from Russia with blood. 
Um, the, the Honourable Lady will be aware that the Government has recently obviously taken on extra powers to enable us to deal with the criminal finances through the Criminal Finances Act. I think it's important that we did that. We are very well aware that the very attractiveness for normal financial activity here in London can, of course, mean that there are those who see, it, see an opportunity for illicit uh, uh, flows of money, and we will take every action against those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Kevin Foster. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome the strength of the Prime Minister's statement today. I'm sure she would, like me, be concerned to see the parallels to a previous time when autocratic leaders decided to challenge the international rules-based system to prove an idea that might would be right. Can she reassure me that she will be working with allies to make very clear to Mr Putin that, like them, he could quite easily go down the path to disaster and defeat as well? Yeah. I will uh, uh, certainly uh, be working with allies to make very clear the defence we have of the international rules-based order and that those who try to attack it will not win. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, inevitably today the focus has been on the Russians that are crooks and cronies of Putin, but there are many decent Russians who have very bravely spoken out against the regime. But those that I have met over the years, both here and in Russia, sometimes feel very alone. So can we not just send out a signal that we are absolutely appalled by what Putin has done. We need to send out a signal of solidarity with those that are trying to resist his regime. No, the Honourable the Honourable Lady speaks well about this uh, this matter. There are those who have bravely spoken out, and we should be very clear um, that, uh, that that we support them in in doing so, and we want to ensure that they are able to do so, and they are free to do so, and that they are able to feel the confidence of doing so without fearing action that might be taken against them as a result. Richard Drax. Mr Speaker, can I too commend my right honourable friend for the statesmanlike way that she is handling this appalling case? And can I also ask her that if indeed it is proved that this is state-sponsored, that the response is not just from the United Kingdom, but from NATO and all our European allies, because together we stand, and divided we provide an opening for this man. I say to my honourable friend that we will, of course, be, we have already been talking with allies about the nature of this uh, act that has taken place, and we will continue to do so, uh, and will be uh, encouraging our allies to recognise the despicable nature of what has happened in the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Edwards. The main security challenges are state-sponsored terrorism, DIES-sponsored terrorism and cyber security. So, shouldn't the uh, UK defence portfolio be redesigned to meet those challenges, as opposed to concentrating on a new generation of nuclear weapons? He refers to a number of threats, and the, uh, obviously the uh, uh, terrorist threat, the uh, uh, threat of hostile state activity are ones of which we ensure that we have the capabilities to address. That is across a variety of actions that the, uh, that the government takes. Uh, I indicated earlier not every response actually sits within the, what would conventionally be called defence. Um, the work of the security and intelligence agencies, the work of the Office um, uh, Against Counterterrorism that sits in the Home Office, these are all part, and that is why our National Security Capability Review is important, in bringing together all parts of our response and ensuring that we have the capabilities we need. Matt Warman. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. And from uh, hacking infrastructure to spreading disinformation, Prime Minister was clearly right to suggest that Russia has been waging a cyber war against the West for a number of years now. As Home Secretary, with cross party support, she took through the Investigatory Powers Bill. Can she reassure the House that if more such powers are needed, she will not hesitate to ask for them? I'm, I'm very happy to give, that, uh, to, to give that confirmation to my honourable friend. My right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, is already looking at uh, what further counter terrorism powers may be needed. Holly Lynch. Thank you. Having spent a great deal of time campaigning for more protections for emergency service workers since my election, it's particularly disappointing that we're having to reflect on how we keep them safe from nerve agents. Can I welcome the Prime Minister's statement, which did very clearly outline that what was particularly reckless about this attack was the decision to use a nerve agent, which would inevitably put members of the public and our emergency services and NHS workers who would have to respond at risk. Can I welcome the news that she is going to put that at the forefront of the meeting she's due to have this week and the seriousness of the risk that presented to police and NHS workers in particular uh, at the forefront of the robust consequences that need to now follow? Yay. The Honourable Lady raises a very important point in relation to our emergency services. We've already, in recent years, uh, had a, a further look at our, the framework under which our emergency services operate uh, and the, uh, in terms of the sorts of incidents that they might need to be uh, responding to. 
but we will, of course, continue to keep this under review. Yeah. Simon Clark. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the attacks on Mr Litvinenko and Colonel Skripal have one thing in common. They were designed not just to kill, but to kill in a particularly terrifying and horrible way. And with that ter- dreadful threat in mind, will the Prime Minister ensure that our national defence is in sufficient shape to meet that Russian threat in its terms of its composition, location and funding? Yes, as I've said in earlier in response to a number of questions, this is a matter of the capabilities that we have across our security, national security and defence. Uh, and it is important that we, we have been conducting a number of reviews and are continuing a number of reviews that go straight to the heart of this matter to ensure we have the capabilities across the board that we need. Martin Doherty Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, may I commend the Prime Minister for their statement and the robustness to which they address the House. In the coming days, when the Prime Minister discusses next actions with her allies, can the Prime Minister assure the House that they will act robustly with some of our more recalcitrant NATO allies who give port to the Russian fleet to allow them to refuel, notably Spain? Enough is enough. Can I say to the honourable gentleman that I will, of course, be, uh, ra- as I've said, I'll be raising this issue with uh, allies, and we'll be talking with them about the nature of the response that we feel is appropriate to such an action having taken place. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Order. I've been